Indian River Lagoon Research Institute. And uh, it's good to again be back in person and <clears throat> collaborating with our partners, uh, the Indian River Lagoon, the Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition. Uh, I think the last time we had an event here was 2019 pre-pandemic, uh, but um, it's nice to be here for this, for this outreach event. Tonight, as, as in the past, we're gonna get updates about restoration efforts in the Indian River Lagoon and, and have an opportunity uh, to get your questions answered by a panel of experts. And I think that's really important to, uh, to kind of get those questions answered directly. And, uh, and this is that, that chance, so, so we're doing it again. Uh, we have note cards. Uh, hopefully you've all picked up note cards in the lobby. Uh, if not, uh, go grab a note card. Uh, write your questions down. So we're going to be uh, managing written questions on the note cards. We'll be passing them up. We have uh, folks in the audience that will be collecting those cards and bringing them back. And they'll be delivered uh, to the podium. Uh, we'll try and get to as many questions as we can uh, in the limited amount of time that we have. And, uh, and, and so the sooner we get, the sooner we get started, uh, the sooner we'll get there. Uh, I would also like to really thank the folks here at Gleason Auditorium, the staff that have, that have made this all possible. Uh, so, so thank you all for your hard work building up. <laughs> and giving us a good portion of your evening dedicated to this event. <clears throat> all right, so... Uh, I guess let's start off. I want to, uh, to welcome the MC for the evening from the Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition, uh, Craig Wallace. Thank you, Thank you Robert. Yep. Thank you and good evening. I, I'm really thrilled to see this turnout. Um, we, never, we didn't know what we were going to get when uh, it, was, it was post COVID, and we were really not really post COVID yet, right? So, but anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, just a quick note. Uh, this is a quick survey. It's only three questions, but if you've got your phone and you want to read QR codes and, and take our survey, we'd appreciate that. So I just wanted to say thank you once again to Robert and the staff here. They've been tremendous hosts. Uh, we've done this before, but you know, just working with these people at Florida Tech is, is just phenomenal. And we also have some of uh, the professors here from Florida Tech today, which is even more exciting for us. So uh, th this tonight is your opportunity to ask questions. That's the main reason we're here. Um, I did also want to mention, I almost forgot, that uh, our sponsor, uh, Atlantic Environmental, uh, we're very thankful to them for putting a little money in the, in the pot to help us get through tonight, today. Um, but so that's, once, if you had trouble reading the QR code before, here it is again. And also there's the uh, Wi-Fi uh, password there, just a little housekeeping. So if you would take the survey, we're going to do another survey at the end just to get an idea of, you know, did you get your questions answered? Are you satisfied with what you heard? So uh, I'm going to uh, go through this a little bit more detail uh, later, but this is kind of our agenda for the evening. Once, I said, once again, we said that we're going to have uh, three presenters to uh, give you some idea of things that they have expertise in so you know what questions to ask. <clears throat> but the uh, main thing is down at the bottom here is the Q&A. So we want to make sure we leave time for that. So we've, I've asked the presenters to try to keep it to 10 minutes so that we can, do, we can get there uh, and have plenty of time for you to uh, answer questions. So, uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to uh, uh, kind of introduce you once again, if you don't know who we are, the Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition. I am the chairman of the group, and this is the greatest group of people I've ever worked with. I mean, this is a totally volunteer organization. Uh, we, well, we do pay an administrator a little bit, not much, but, uh, but basically everybody in the coalition uh, works very hard, and they've all worked at, at uh, bringing this together. And you basically see them around, they'll be wearing blue shirts, and probably most of them have name tags on, so if you see them, say, just say thank you. But a lot of people, when they look at this and say, well, that's just a bunch of old men, right? And, and, and we've had that comment a lot, but we are trying to diversify a little bit, but I just want to let you know that the, the original uh, uh, 
nine, I guess, or eight or whatever it was when, when the coalition first formed back in 2014, which is basically to uh, us working along with other nonprofits in the area, along with the county, uh, are, we're really the drivers of this half cent sales tax, which we will talk a little bit more about tonight for the Save Our Indian River Lagoon program. So that was a big, that was the starting point. <clears throat> but we've changed a bit since then. So I just want to give you a little perspective on what's happened. We, last year, some of the original founding members uh, left the group. I think we lost three people last year. But by, by uh, January, we had already picked up three more, and that's the top picture. That was taken in January. And we, since then, we've added four additional ones here. So we're, we're growing, and we're, uh, I think we're going to make some real impact going forward here. So I just wanted to introduce you to them. These are all hardworking people, believe me. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> so just to give you a little perspective on what the coalition does, we are primarily trying to educate the community on what's going on with the lagoon, try to keep up to date with the Save Our Indian River Lagoon program in terms of the projects they're doing, broadcast that information out to everybody. But the other part of what we do is advocacy. And this is a big thing. Uh, recently, you may have uh, seen some uh, uh, recent re legislation that has, has uh, been passed or not passed that is pro or con lagoon. So <clears throat> what we want to do is form, in, and this is a fairly uh, recent thing we've done, is, <clears throat> is lagoon voices. Uh, this is a new program we have. You can find it on our website here or just take the, the QR code there and you'll go to it. But what this is, is we're trying to educate people on the best way to communicate with their legislators, with commissioners, with whoever it is we want to send a message to, to get a significant impact by having hordes of people send emails, call, you know, any way we can to get the message through. And it's to support the specific legislation that we're interested in, good for the lagoon, and it's also to, to make them aware that, that people are, are concerned about certain things. Uh, <clears throat> so join this group, and we, we'll try to keep the, uh, the information fresh on there, but this is a, an important effort we've got going, and, and uh, please sign up if you get a chance. <clears throat> so uh, like I said, this is all about trying to uh, get your questions answered. So the agenda for tonight is... Uh, the, we'll have uh, three, uh, three speakers in addition to me, but we'll have three speakers, uh, and the first speaker is going to be Dwayne DeFries, and I don't know how many of you know Dwayne, probably a good portion of you. <laughs> we are very fortunate to have Dwayne here tonight, um, and you know, he's been here to most of our uh, uh, straight talks, and we've done, I think, seven of them so far. Uh, but he is someone that, you know, he's a wealth of information and everything about the lagoon. So he's the guy you, you want to ask questions of or all of the panelists. But Dwayne knows a lot of the answers. So we're, we're very fortunate to have him. <coughs> Dwayne is obviously the, uh, <coughs> the executive director of the IRL NEP, which is the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. Uh, <coughs> but uh, Dwayne also is a volunteer. <laughs> he volunteers for in a, in a wide array of things. Uh, among them, uh, he serves on the board of the Florida Ocean Alliance and, and, and was appointed by the governor as a member of the Harmful Algal Bloom Task Force. Now, that's a really important uh, uh, group that's working on trying to create some future le legislation to try to get some of the, uh, the water quality issues under control. Lagoon's gonna, uh, Dwayne is going to be speaking, uh, giving us a perspective of not just what, it, you know, what are the problems of the lagoon, but what can we do... What are we looking forward to? What, what are some of the things that maybe some of you haven't even heard about yet that, uh, <clears throat> that are solutions in the future? Then we're going to have uh, Vinny Toronto. Uh, Vinny is the, uh, <clears throat> the Citizens Oversight Committee for the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Chair. Uh, Vinny has been with this, uh, the uh, Citizens Oversight Committee since the very beginning. Uh, so he has a pretty good insight on what goes on there. So Vinny's going to give you a, a good perspective on what they do. There's been a lot of questions about, you know, who's on, on the, uh, the, the committee or on the, uh, <coughs> the Citizens Oversight Committee, and what do they really do? I mean, do they specify what, you know, what projects are to be done or what goes on there? So Vinny will give you 
a good background on that. Vinny is the technology representative on the um, on the the uh, committee, and there are, there are people from all different fields, and Vinny will go into that in a little bit more. But uh, Vinny has a technology background, and he'll talk about that in a little bit. Lastly, and not, not least, uh, we have finally got a space on the agenda for some technology uh, uh, speaker from the, the university here. Uh, uh, Jeff Evil has uh, been working for the past couple of years on a uh, lagoon inflow project, which some of you may have heard about, may be interested in. But the, <coughs> the objective here is to try to do a test of how can we get some of the ocean water to get into the lagoon and figure out how it can possibly improve the status of the lagoon and, and help uh, reduce some of the, uh, the, pollu the, the pollutants in the lagoon. So we'll let <coughs> Jeff speak on that, but it's really good and we really appreciate the Florida Tech for uh, providing us the resources to, <coughs> to have him speak here today. So, that's kind of the, uh, the intro. Uh, I, we do uh, have, th so the questioning was going to work like this. So hopefully you all got your index cards. Uh, write your question down on the index cards. Hand it to, we're going to have some blue shirts kind of walking up and down the aisles. As we go through the presentations, just kind of hand it, uh, pass it to the side of the aisle, and we'll pick them up and bring them up here, and I will ask the panelists the questions. Uh, we can't really you know, pass a microphone around this large an audience, so that's how we've chosen to do it today. But get your questions, you know, if you've got some questions right now, go ahead and write them down. We'll get, we'll get you some more cards. But that's the main reason why we're here, is to get the questions out there. So, without further ado, I'd like to get this on <coughs> rolling. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, Dwayne DeFries, who surfer dude known to his friends, but uh, Dwayne is, uh, <coughs> is going to tell you a lot of information. So, thank you, and here's Dwayne. Good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, I look around the room, I see a lot of uh, not only old friends, but new friends. And it made me think while we were sitting here that, you know, as we go decade to decade, and for me, it's now over four decades, uh, kind of being in this room, I started in 1978 at Florida Institute of Technology as a grad student. But it reminded me that conservation movements have beginnings. And we often, as we move forward in life, forget where we came from. So I want to take a moment to recognize Diane Burrill, who's in the room. If there was a mother, <laughs> if there was a mother of Indian River Lagoon conservation, it's Diane, founder of Marine Resources Council, I can tell you, Without a doubt, because I was there, there would be no national estuary program without Diane. So Diane, thanks for coming out. It's great to see you. Uh, but that is our beginning right there. And what you see today largely is happening because of that seed that was planted some 40 plus years ago. And, and so you should all be proud about the, the history and, and also where we're headed. So I've been given 10 minutes. So I'm gonna give you a speed run through kind of what's happening in the lagoon, you know, where's the money coming from, who's doing what, and then hopefully we'll open up for questions and answer some of the details. Um, one of the things we always forget, this is not a normal estuary, you know, it's not like Tampa Bay, fully flush, big and round. It's not like Narragansett Bay. We are narrow, we are shallow, we only have limited access to the ocean, and we often forget that the narrowness is part of the reason that we are vulnerable. And we also forget, and I'm gonna mention this a few times, that we are the problem. We are the cause of the problems in the Indian River Lagoon, and those problems are coming from the West, for the most part. It's the watershed. It's the conveyance of water, and pollutants, and nutrients, and sediments. And so this vulnerability is part and parcel of what makes us unique, but it's also part of the reason we are where we are today, because we did not get out in front of some of the infrastructure issues that we knew were coming back in you know, the 80s, and, and we are here now living some of the fears we had some 30 plus years ago. Uh, the past decade has been um, 
both a surprise and not a surprise for many of us who are scientists. We knew nutrients were going to be a problem. We didn't know how they were going to convey. But this is how we see the, the last, really, 10 years since 2011, and actually even earlier. So these photos right here are 2016. But when we have massive billion-gallon discharges from Lake Okeechobee, uh, often carrying toxic cyanobacteria like microcystis, uh, we wind up not just corrupting the environmental health of the St. Lucie River, the estuary, and the southern Indian River Lagoon, but this is a human uh, and wildlife health problem. In the middle is our 2016 uh, Oreo Umbra bloom. Our problems really hit hard in 2011 with the super bloom, and I'm going to show you in a minute, but what turned out to be a super bloom wasn't so super in 2011 because it got worse. And this is the brown tide bloom in 2016, a novel uh, plankton that we hadn't seen before. It showed up first in 2012 and 13, had a big bloom in 16. Because of the way it bloomed, because of the intense nature, because it has certain characteristics like a mucus coat, it was really hard on fish but really hard on seagrasses. This was 2020. This is a na nanocyanobacteria uh, that actually we don't even know what the genus is. Uh, also another novel species that, you know, bloomed for almost, you know, it began in June right around now and lasted almost till Thanksgiving. We had minor fish kills, but they were very minor compared to earlier on. And I just threw these in to let you know that even in little places you can have crazy blooms. These are two canals in Coco. Um, one was bright red, you know, and almost, uh, I made a comment, it was around Easter, that was quoted quite badly in the newspaper. I think the quote from me was, it was biblical, and I still have scientists give me a hard time about that one. But this is what we see. You know, this is what we have been facing up until last year. And so this is the good news, and I hope it lasts, because this could change tonight for tomorrow. I was right on the shores of the Indian River Lagoon today. Water clarity is spectacular. We've had some of the best water clarity um, that we've seen in over a decade for now over a year. We've had blooms. They've been small. They've been sporadic. But the fact is, I'm hoping this is both a combination of weather, because there's no question dry weather helps, but also a combination of all the work that you're going to see in a minute. But this is what it looks like from the scientists. And you can see here you know, how we went through 97, this low, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but then all of a sudden, 2011, super bloom, we hit a tipping point of activity, and that activity changed the water quality, it corrupted the ability of light to get to the seagrasses, and this was the beginning of a nine-year transition of change that we have been dealing with uh, since 2011. Uh, this work is from FLIPS, uh, a scientist at University of Florida. Uh, 14 publications have come out in the last 14 months that tell this story from the science side in a compelling and very dynamic way. If you look at what happened with seagrasses at the same time, and this is data from the St. John's River Water Management District, also just published, um, you can see that when you look at different parameters of seagrasses, the length of a transect, the density of the plants, you can see that we were looking pretty good. We were increasing to some degree, both in transect length, uh, but we were decreasing in biomass a little bit. 2011, a massive drop in seagrass. Um, and then we had this rebound in 14, 15, and, and we had a dry period. And so well, seagrasses started to come back. And then in 16, the brown tide, was the beginning of this catastrophic drop. And if you look at the biomass, and of course this is what manatees and other animals that eat seagrasses are looking at, we were really stable in overall biomass. And then in 2011, we started to drop and we've been slowly dropping to where we are now, uh, which is a dramatic loss of seagrasses. Over 60,000 acres lost. Uh, we're 90% lost in, in biomass and coverage. And, and now this is what we look like in a lot of places. You know, it's basically barren, and if there's 
something growing, it's not usually seagrasses, it's usually algae. And so the transition has been from seagrasses, which you can see on the left, to areas of large drift algae. And right now we have a massive set of this benthic macroalgae, it's called calerpa. So those of you who fish, if you're looking through a, a giant acreage and you think it's all seagrasses, it's probably calerpa. But the good news is seagrasses is trying to come back, but there's so little left. And because it's a flowering plant, slow growing, the, you know, the roots don't expand quickly, it rarely goes to flower and seed. Uh, we are gonna be challenged in this recovery and it is gonna take years and decades. So we're gonna need to help it um, probably with planting, but we're not gonna plan our way to success. And of course, you all know about what's going on with manatees. Uh, last I saw, we were 575 uh, deaths this year. You need to know not, not every single one of these animals uh, has starved to death, but starvation is prevalent. Uh, this is not going to solve itself quickly. Um, I would not at all be surprised at the end of this year if we're looking close to what we had the year before, which was 1,100 animals. Uh, this is a serious issue for the manatee population and also a serious issue for recovery because uh, these animals are out trying to find anything they can find to eat. And it's not just manatees. It's pinfish. It's green sea turtles. It's every commercial and residential fish species that, you know, we know that, that needs seagrasses for either habitat, you know, or food resources. So we have a system that's you know, unstable, highly vulnerable, and it's gonna take a while. We need to be working hard to solve the problem. And the problem really starts and stops with one issue. And that is we have too many nutrients in the system. Uh, those nutrients come from land, from inadequate and aging wastewater treatment systems, from 300,000 plus septic systems in the watershed, from stormwater systems that are picking up sediments, fertilizers, nutrients, everything you can find on the roadway and transporting all of that, you know, through the system. And fresh water being delivered in large volume in itself is a problem. You know, it's like having buckets of fresh water dropped on your head if you're a snook. So this is a water and this is a, a nutrient issue. I'm being told I've only got one minute left, so I don't know how that happened so fast. <laughs> So here's a speed dial through the minute. So what are the, the solutions? The solutions are every, we need to have every dollar we can to reduce nutrients at the source everywhere we can. Uh, we have BMAPs. Those BMAPs are regulatory. Uh, they set up, they're called Basin Management Action Plans. You know, they're gonna set up nutrient reduction um, and projects over on the regulatory side and we've also got reasonable assurance plans, and these plans are underway, but you can see if you look at just the projects that are planned, there's a lot of projects that are still needed. And if we look at nutrient reduction, and, and this is from Chuck Jacoby at the Water Management District, and just look at the percent remaining in the two nutrients we worry about, uh, which is nitrogen and phosphorus, we've got a lot of work to do on our BMAPs to get those BMAPs to the point that projects are done and nutrients hit their targets. The Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program does not do regulatory issues. We're non-regulatory, but we coordinate amongst all the players kind of along the lagoon and try to help coordinate, uh, corroborate, you know, communicate. And, and so we work through our authority in Section 320 to try to make this happen. Uh, we have very limited funding, but we leverage that funding as far as we can go. The good news is that we're gonna get additional uh, 900 plus thousand a year for the next five years from the infrastructure uh, bill from the feds. Uh, half of that is gonna go to seagrass restoration efforts. Um, we have a plan in place. That plan is being implemented at multiple levels, including 32 vital signs and the ones that you see the red dots are the issues we think are most critical. And it's all about reducing nutrients and pollutants, you know, looking at seagrasses, harmful algal blooms, and funding of projects. And I'm gonna go uh, slightly over, but uh, bear with me. Uh, we've already expended 9.9 .9 million, 139 projects completed, 
over 30 projects underway. We're going to add at least 25 more before October for an October 1 start, including this new bipartisan infrastructure money. Uh, but the real story here is what happened just recently, and that is we had another historic year in the Florida legislature. Um, I'm counting over 79 million in projects in the counties, and look at Brevard County. 43 million in projects identified, so when you see our elected official House and Senate members, especially Senator Debbie Mayfield, you need to say thank you. This is a big investment in infrastructure and clean water at the state level. And this is the real story here and, and why we are all here and why I'm excited. The Brevard County Save Our Indian River Lagoon tax that was enacted in 2016 is really the only real hope this system has for recovery because it's delivering on a recurring basis, year to year over 10 years, the kind of money that we need to do the work, right now estimated at 48.6 million a year. And so this is where we stand so far. We're projecting 542 million, 250 million have been collected. We have 372 projects identified in that county plan, 63 projects completed, you can see the tallies on phosphorus and nitrogen. On average, we're about, you know, just a little over 70% to target. Lots of work to do, lots of money to invest, lots of projects to move forward. So I'll end with this. This all starts and stops with us as individuals. Each of these R's, whether we're supporting research, whether we're supporting restoration and rebuilding infrastructure, the key is we have to have number nine and 10 embedded in our DNA. We need to have a resolve. This is not going to fix itself overnight. And we need to take responsibility as individuals, as communities, as state and federal agencies to get this work done. Every year we don't get it done. It costs more and there's more damage to the lagoon. And so the time value of money is essential here. And the ability to work with you as citizens is critical. Your support of Sorrel in 2016 is why I have hope. Your willingness to get dirty and get in the water and do restoration projects is why I have hope. And your willingness to come out on a hot night, you know, in the middle of the week to hear me speak is why I have hope, but I question your sanity sometimes. <laughs> uh, but individuals will make this happen. So I'm gonna close just by saying I am available to you We'll answer questions and we'll do what we can to keep this momentum going. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dwayne. Um, all right, we're going to do it ahead, just pod this down. There we go. Now we're good. Here, Craig, I got something like that. Let me try. All right. Okay, so, wow, uh, that was good. That was quick. I'm going to try to be even quicker. So, look, I'm going to prime your brain. I'm going to prime it. There's going to be lots of questions. You're going to be like, wait, what did you just say? What did you say? That's good. That's good. Fill those questions out, put them in the cards, and we'll move forward. So, um, again, I am Vinny Toronto, I think. Um, I'm wearing his shoes, and this presentation is called How the Citizen Oversight Committee Works. Uh, let's see if the clicker works. If not, we'll just say next. Oh, there we go. Works for you. Oh, it disappeared. Hold on. There we go. How the Oversight Committee works for you. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Again, my name is Vinny Toronto. I'm the chairman of the Citizens Oversight Committee. Uh, my email is up there and my phone number is up there. At least I think it is. It could be a Domino's Pizza, but call and see. Anyways, here we go. See that web address right there? That web address is so important. So important. Everything I'm going to go over today, everything I go over today, plus so much more, is available right there. That address. Now, I know you're thinking, like, Vinny, that's kind of long. You know, can you remember it? And no, I don't remember it. I just Google S-O-I-R-L. And so that's what I would tell you to do. Save our Indian River Lagoon. If you Google that, the first result that will come up will be the Brevard County Save Our Indian River Lagoon website with all the information. 
So here we go. How did we get a Citizens Oversight Committee? That's a good question. As Dwayne talked about, um, there were um, different harmful algal blooms that started after 2011. In 2016, there was a really bad one, really bad one. And uh, it, had a, it, caught, it was a massive harmful algal bloom that caused pervasive fish kill throughout the lagoon. When that happened, or as that was happening, there was also a half-cent sales tax ballot initiative being created, as well as an initial project plan. And you'll see the word project plan bolded there because that's so important. That project plan, which we update yearly, it's like our Bible. Everything that we do, everything that is done for the lagoon is done in, is in the project plan. So like I said, where, where, where can you find the project plan? Oh, boom, there it is. It's right there on our website. So if you go to our website, if you do the project plan up in the top, the circle on the right, and then you see there's an arrow down below, that's the 22 project plan. Hot off the presses as for three months ago, I think it passed um, from the county commission. So anyways, that's up there. Um, there was also an ordinance that was written. That ordinance had language which created the Citizens Oversight Committee to increase responsiveness and transparency. And where can you find that ordinance? Boom, right there, there you go. So it's also on our website, again, so you get the point. All these documents and many more are on our website, so please go there. Okay, uh, next, all right. And then in November of 2016, you all, as Dwayne said, passed the half cent sales tax. And that, that, that was huge, that was huge. Um, it really is, it's a pervasive, it's not pervasive, but it's a continuous amount of, of money that will be spent on the lagoon in a long-term plan in an organized and efficient fashion. That's huge. So thank you all for doing that. Okay, so. Uh, maybe I'm hitting the wrong, oh. Hitting the wrong button. All right, now we go. There we go. Who is on the Citizens Oversight Committee? All right, and now your starting lineup of the Citizens Oversight No, I'm just kidding, here we go. So these are your Citizens Oversight Committee, and I'm gonna go through them because it's really important. These are citizens. These are people like me. I just, you know, I live in a house that's in the Atlantic. I walk the streets a lot to get some exercise. So uh, please reach out to these people. Ask us questions, talk to us, give us input. We need that. So you'll see we have education outreach, the vice chair, Dr. Stephanie Ely and Kimberly Newton. You'll also see there's an L and a C by each person's name. And that's because seven members are chosen by the Space Coast League of Cities. That's city representatives, whether it's your mayors or your city council members. The other seven are by county commission. So it's really important. It's a split of power, and, it, and, and I think it's a, one of the a brilliant parts of the plan. And then there's also a voting member. Those are the people under the member, and an alternate. So again, you've got education outreach, uh, Dr. Stephanie Ely and Kimberly Newton. Finance, you've got Courtney Barker, Todd Swingle. Uh, for Lagoon Advocacy, we have Dr. John Windsor, Terry Casto, Real Estate, Susan Hodges, and Eric Manns. And Science, we have Lorraine Koss and Charles Venuto. Oh my gosh, my nephew must have got to this slide before me. No, I'm kidding, I did that myself. Um, I love 3D glasses, who doesn't? Anyway, so Technology, you've got me, Vinny Toronto, and David Scherer. And finally, for Tourism, we have David Lane and Laura Lee Thompson. And so as I said, there are seven positions chosen by your city representatives, seven positions chosen by the county commission, and there are two-year terms with the possibility to be reappointed. Okay, when does the Citizen Oversight Committee meet? We meet monthly on the third Friday at 8.30 in Vieira in Building C on the third floor in the Florida Room. Uh, it's also broadcast live, Space Coast Government TV, for those of you who haven't cut the cord yet, uh, Brevard County's website, Brevard County's Facebook page, those are the places it's available live. Now this is a secret, this is a secret, this is one of those hacks. It's also on the Sorrel YouTube page after, and it's indexed. So what does that mean? So you'll look here in the description, it has a breakdown of where everything took place. So our meetings are long. We had a meeting, I think it was six hours. That's a long time to be watching. So if you'd like to, just go to the YouTube, uh, our YouTube page, and you'll see, um, I think starting now going forward, we didn't do this all the time, but, but it's, a, it's a great idea. Again, we're continuously getting better, 
And so you can click on the time, and it will take you right to that point. You'll also see in the top right, it says playback speed, normal. That's another one of those life hacks. You can do it at two times and get twice as much information in the same amount of seconds. It's crazy. 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 Okay. So here we go to the next slide. All right. What does the Citizens Oversight Committee do? We represent the citizens in yearly recommendations to revise the project plan to the Board of County Commissioners. That's it. It's kind of simple, but it's also kind of complex. So if you were to look at that and put it in a flow chart, we'd have the citizens. That's you all right there. The Citizen Oversight Committee, that's us, and you'll see there's a two-way arrow. Information and communication goes back and forth. You'll also see our square is transparent for our transparency, and, and the border is porous to allow things to come in and out, and the Burrard County Board of County Commissioners. Again, with the two-way arrow going back and forth as far as sharing information. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit closer, a little bit more detail. So again, you've got the Citizens Oversight Committee. Every month, we take the latest science we take through expert presentations, we take that as input, then every month we also have the staff and natural resource management development give us project progress and funding info. Every month we also take citizen input through public comment. So that's what we do every month. Those, those three things happen. Then yearly we take all the information we've received and we do a project plan update that we recommend to the county commissioner. And we do it based on a cost benefit. All the reimbursements have a pound per nitrogen or phosphorus value attached to it. And so we look at what is the most efficient. And then we give it to the Board of County Commission as our recommendation. Sometimes they say, well, we'd like this. Sometimes they say we'd like that. Or they pass it. So that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Now let's look a little bit closer. Expert presentations. Dr. Windsor um, uh, assimilated or, or uh, uh, accumulated this, uh, this list of presentations. Those are all the presentations we've had uh, through November of 2021. So there's a lot of information that has been in my brain. If it's still there, I don't know, but it, it was once there. Okay, then we also, okay, I'm a technology guy, technology guy, this is cool, it's cool, and I'm going to go over it briefly and for more questions, again, priming your brain. This, they're now, this was at our latest meeting, they're now using satellites, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3, to look at the harmful algal blooms throughout the lagoon, find out exactly where they are, when they are, historically. And so this is really cool because we started with a system. We've got a system-wide harmful algal bloom. Well, now we're looking at it individually where it's at. So that's cool. I'm a technology guy. Also, and as Dwayne said, our system is wind-driven. So there was this really cool presentation as well where they, they mapped little particles in the lagoon and where they would go based on the wind. And you'll see in June, look at all the red in the, in the top part of the, of the Indian River Lagoon. And then look in September how that red goes all the way down. So again, we're learning so much more every meeting to try to make the plan more efficient and better um, for us all. So uh, also monthly, we look at our revenue charts. That's the money that we've collected each year. And then quarterly, quarterly we do project, reimbur project reimbursements. So this is a list of all the projects, and we do this every quarter. We get an update. We also do quarterly grant acquisitions. This is a new form. Again, we're changing. We're adding things. So this is a list of grants that we were able to acquire because we're spending money on the lagoon, because you all decided to do the half-cent sales tax. So we're using our money to multiply to get even more monies. It's a lot of monies with S at the end, monies. Um, but, but so this is, a new, this is a new form that we're now looking at. Oops, I keep hitting the, uh, the fade to black. Um, we'll go here. All right, the next one, quarterly project progress. And you'll see that the projects have a color rating to them. And that lets us know kind of which ones are getting behind their timeline. And it also lists what they're doing and where they are in the progress. And a lot of these projects have multiple steps, design, and then uh, construction, and then monitoring. So it's very complex. Uh, finally, we do a yearly audit. Okay, next thing. Bless you. Okay, and then this is the general agenda. So this is for our citizen input. You'll see that we take public comment taken on all propositions before the Citizens Oversight Committee. Um, we also have public comment at every meeting. And the yearly project plan update. So again, I talked about the brilliance of the plan. 
This is one of the brilliant, another one of the brilliant things, I think, is the plan does change. The plan changes. This isn't something that somebody put in place in 10 years and says, we're just going to ride it out. So that was our original plan breakdown in 2016. And you'll notice the 66% in gray, that was muck removal. And the 14% was uh, sewer. And so if you look now, that's the 22 plan. In 2019, through public comment and science, reimbursements were reallocated towards septic. And if you look now, there's 31% as opposed to 14. Now there is a light gray you'll see, and that's interstitial water, which is the water that comes out of the muck. We actually broke it down. We're treating it even more to try to have cleaner water going back in. But the, 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 the muck uh, amount went from 66 to 37, and the septic went up. Okay. Uh, additional examples that we've learned is the reuse water. We're spending more money to try to treat re reuse water and leaky laterals um, to homes. So the current progress of the project, again, Dwayne went over some of this stuff, so I'll breeze right through it. Uh, the soil tax has collected $250 million. $269 million is completed or underway for projects that are underway. Um, we currently expect to raise $542 million for 372 projects. And that's in the plan, so take a look at the plan. Again, 63 completed projects have reduced total nitrogen by 124,000 pounds uh, and total phosphorus by 10,000 pounds, and that's annually. That's not this year, that's every year. So it's compounded. Current project plans result in a reduction of 1.2 million pounds of nitrogen and 106,000 pounds of phosphorus. What comes next for the Citizen Oversight Committee? I know I'm over, probably. Okay, so we're halfway through the current tax. And you'll see, this was a cool chart that was in the project plan. And you'll look, we've got Save Our Indian Lagoon outputs, short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And if you look in the short-term, you've got early adopters lead. And now the mid-term, supporters join. And as Dwayne talked about, we're getting more grants. We're getting state support. We're getting other organizations. There really is this groundswell of support happening. And if you also look in the midterm, you'll see cleaner lagoon water. The water is cleaner. MRC's lagoon report card gave the water, I think it was a C plus, the water quality. The water quality is improving. So we've got lots, lots more to go, but we're getting there. And this was a plan. So um, we're getting there. Groundswell of support will continue, as I said. Science will continue to improve. I'm a technology guy, I love science. And there will be new project types. And to talk to you about one of these new project types, um, up next is gonna be Joc uh, Dr. Ebel. He's gonna talk to you about a really exciting project that presented in front of our committee and I'm excited to hear just like you guys are. All right, Dr. Ebel. Thank you all for the opportunity. I'm, I'm really pleased to have a chance to introduce our projects, and, and I, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity just to, to learn more about the lagoon and the great work that's going on. I, th thank, I really want to thank Dwayne for the great work the NEP is doing and, uh, and, and will continue to do, and then also I want to thank the Brevard County for all the amazing work that they've been doing. Uh, it, it's really only through our joint effort that we can uh, hope to see the lagoon recover and, uh, and, and, and become something that's, that we remember from the stories that, that we've heard from you know, some of you who've been here for a long time or, or for, for myself who I've only been here for a short time and I, I hear from you folks what the lagoon used to look like. And I, and I really look forward to being able to experience that with you. And, and so we have this one project that's a bit of a change of pace. Brevard County is, is supporting a, a broad range of projects, as, as Vinny introduced. The, the NEP is, is helping to facilitate lots of different projects and coordinating efforts between lots of different groups to be able to help improve the, the health and, and water quality of the lagoon. Here, right now, what we're presenting is just one project that's the potentially a complement to, to the, this other work that's ongoing. And, uh, and so I, I want to thank everybody that's been involved in, in our project. This is a, a large group. Even this, this one question of whether we can use enhanced ocean water exchange to, Im to help improve the lagoon, this takes a big group of people just to answer this one relatively straightforward question. And, and so we have a large group here at the university that's, that's 
supporting this project, and we work uh, in the area with a, a, a lot of support and a lot of coordination and a lot of input from resource management agencies, uh, and from other scientists, and, 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 and uh, uh, private businesses as well. And, and so, and before I get going, I also definitely, I need to thank the taxpayers, the state taxpayers, all of you, and the representatives, Randy Fine, Thad Altman, and Senators Tom Wright, and Debbie Mayfield for their support for this project. We're now two years into this project with state funding. We've just been awarded our third year of funding for this project. I'll go a little bit into that coming up. And it's really due to representative support and to securing that, that funding for us to allow us to go forward. And, and so as Duane introduced, and, and I don't want to belabor the point, but, but obviously the lagoon is in trouble. Um, I, I have here just some, some data that really just highlights kind of how bad it is. Dwayne, Dwayne mentioned seagrass, the, the problem with seagrasses in the lagoon, and the dramatic decline that we've seen over the last 10 or so years. This is data from, the bana from Banana River in particular, which has really suffered over the last 10 plus years. Um, the Banana River and the Northern IRL in particular have seen the, 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 the biggest seagrass losses uh, across the lagoon. Um, and you, you can see the, uh, the, the big drop in seagrasses in 2010, and then a sub subsequent drop again after the, the uh, harmful algal blooms in 2016. Banana River is down, they've lost about 90%, 98% of their seagrasses. That, that's a really catastrophic impact for a system that depends on that habitat for processing nutrients, but also as habitat for over 200 species of fishes. So that, that's really of significant concern. And it's, it really has to do with the nutrients. And, and our project right now, what we're seeing is we have some opportunity, some potential opportunity to actually help reduce nutrient loads. And the Banana River in particular is what we're, we're focusing on currently, but this is potentially an idea that could be explored for other locations as well. And so, while we have some ideas going forward that pr provide some maybe additional tools to apply to this question, we definitely have to recognize that there are proven efforts out there, proven activities underway that are already reducing nutrient loads in the lagoon. A as both Duane and Vinny uh, highlighted, there's a lot of work going on, infrastructure improvements, muck dredging, habitat restoration, that are all making a difference already. And these are demonstrated, uh, proven, strategies to help improve water quality and restore the system. And we want to, we're going to need to continue these efforts in order to ensure the success uh, and the restoration of the lagoon. What we've been tasked with is seeing whether enhanced ocean water exchange can actually complement the ongoing efforts. Whether it actually can work kind of in synergy with these other restoration efforts to help maybe more quickly or more broadly improve water quality in the lagoon and then ultimately like the system heal itself. Because that's what our goal is. We can't just simply fix, uh, fix this problem, engineer our way to, this, to a solution here. We are actually, all of these efforts that, that, we've been, that have been described, that you've heard today and that you've heard at other points, really all of that is about trying to help stabilize the lagoon and give the lagoon a chance to heal itself and with a little bit of help. And so we have actually seen in other locations similar projects actually work to improve water quality, to reduce algal loads, and to allow the systems and the habitats and the species within those, those systems to re recover. Um, we've seen them uh, here in Florida in, in some small scale, uh, small scale effort in Destin Harbor, but also nationally larger scale efforts and then globally as well. So this idea that we, you can potentially use inflow, it's worked elsewhere, but we're not sure whether it's we're gonna work here in the IRL. It, the, every system is different. Every system needs, in order before you implement something like this, you need to really explore a whole variety of questions before you can make a decision of whether this is an appropriate strategy. And the NEP had recognized that. They identified in their, their um, uh, citizen, in their uh, uh, management plan, that a pilot study would be appropriate to help us better understand whether this is a useful tool going forward. Based on that, St. John's River Waters Man Management District initiated a study in 2017 where they were looking at some candidate sites for an inflow. They were pricing out some different potential future systems just to get a handle on whether it's even feasible to consider the options. And so where we're at right now is we're building off of this work. We're recognizing that elsewhere, globally, this uh, a similar idea, similar concepts have actually helped to improve water quality. 
And then St. John's, we're building off of the work that they've done, identifying candidate sites and, and uh, designing some preliminary concept designs for the engineering of, of what would be a, a fairly large system ultimately. And so in order to ask this question, in order to answer these questions, there are a lot of lower level or, or embedded questions that we have to address. We, and if we're going to say, let, if we're going to move a large volume of ocean water into the lagoon, we need to understand what the impact is going to be on lagoon circulation. We need to understand what the impact is going to be on, on sediment movement. We need to understand what's the impact on the actual nutrients themselves. How are they going to actually respond to this inflow? And so with the, the, we're looking at the geochemistry. We're looking at how the sediments respond to these changes in water quality and whether they can potentially be enabled and promoted and restored to actually complement this, these reductions. And we're also looking at how the existing habitats and the existing resources, which have been hammered over the last 20 years, how they will respond because we don't want to cause further harm. And it's really important that we, t we consider that, that we improve our understanding of the lagoon and we make sure that we're going forward with the best data possible before we make this decision. And so we have this multi-phase, multidisciplinary project. We include, we have an engineering team as well that's looking at different designs for a pilot project, a demonstration project, and then future potential larger scale projects. And so, and that's what we're actually moving on to at this point right now. We have, so far, we've completed two years of research with state funding where we've done some preliminary modeling. We've built up our models, now we're integrating models, we're integrating hydrology and geochemistry and the biology into one model to better understand how the lagoon is going to respond. We've collected uh, baseline data to better understand resource distribution, where, where, where species occur and how they behave and how they might respond to inflow. Um, and, and with that, now we have a number of really interesting predictions that give us some idea about how the lagoon might respond, but we have to test those predictions. We need to move some water and we need to actually see what happens when we move water and do our, our, do our predictions hold up? And so that's where we're at right now. We were just recently funded for phase three, which is to, to initiate the first steps towards constructing a demonstration inflow project. And so, and that's, uh, we'll be focusing on piloting, uh, on pilot, I'm sorry, We'll be focusing on permitting for that project and uh, engineering for the, the demonstration system and then continuing to collect our data and improve our models. And then with that, as long as we continue, we're able to continue getting support, we will go forward with construction and operation of this, this demonstration system. We'll be testing our assumptions and then we'll be summarizing the results for everybody to, uh, to take a look at so that we together can make a decision of whether this is an appropriate strategy to use, whether this is really a cost-effective strategy um, that can complement ongoing efforts. And so with that, I want to highlight some of our preliminary findings. And so what we've seen, and this is, this is a big team, we have a lot of data, a 500-page report was our, our report from the end of phase two, uh, phase two. I've tried to some kind of pull that down to just a couple key points, and I'm already at two minutes. Man, time flies. So I, I have a couple key points here that I really want to make. So the preliminary findings are showing that we, are, we have the potential with inflow to reduce nutrient loads or reduce the bioavailable nutrients, the fertilizer that is powering these harmful algal bloom outbreaks. It's what our modeling is suggesting. It's what the geochemistry is suggesting, is that if we actually do move ocean water into the lagoon, we have an opportunity potentially to reduce nutrients and reduce harmful algal bloom outbreaks. What's really important is that we're not just flushing these nutrients to an other, another portion of the lagoon or to offshore environments. This is not a flushing project, even though it regularly gets described that way and it's kind of an intuitive way to describe it. What we're seeing is that we're actually potentially have the opportunity to improve the processing and the removal of nutrients right on site in the Banana River with a system like this. And so, and so what we don't want to see is we're not, we don't want to export our problems to other portions of the lagoon. What we do want to see though is we actually have to potentially reduce nutrients on site in the Banana River and to improve the water quality in the Banana River and to keep the Banana River from exporting its problems, which it currently does, to other portions of the lagoon. 
So the reason that we see this, the reason that we're seeing these effects, these, these impacts in our preliminary data is because of the importance of the sediments and the health of the sediment to nutrient quality, to, to, to nutrient concentrations. This is improving our understanding of the lagoon, and it's actually changing how we view the lagoon. The sediments play an incredibly critical role in this process, and I really want to thank and call out, actually, Dr. Austin Fox, who's here, who's, uh, his work has led to our improved understanding of how inflow might work and how we might be able to better restore the lagoon. And so what we see is that the lagoon itself right now is regularly experiencing low oxygen. And the sediments themselves throughout the lagoon are intermittently experiencing low oxygen. In some cases, there's locations that are experiencing low oxygen regularly, almost nightly. Every time that happens, nutrients are released from those sediments and they're actually making the problem worse. They're fertilizing the harmful algal bloom outbreaks that we want to get rid of. With inflow, and with other projects as well that improve circulation, we have a potential opportunity to improve the oxygen availability to the sediments. And by that, we have the opportunity to improve sediment health, the potential opportunity to improve sediment health, and then improve, allow the sediments themselves to process and remove these nutrients, which is the job that they want to do. Give them oxygen, give the microbes that live within the sediments oxygen, and they will start consuming those nutrients. They will remove them from the system, and they will help us restore the system. And so we now are at a point where we need to test these predictions. We need to do it by moving water. We've proposed to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to construct a relatively, slow, uh, relatively small inflow system here at Port Canaveral. You can see the port here and then the port locks. The inflow system would be, in its, would be here located in the locks itself. This is a proposed concept map for our proposed engineering design for this, the pilot system. And, uh, and then the outflow site would be down in this cove here, which is just south of the locks. And so this would be our study area. This would be where we would be testing our predictions about the impacts of inflow. This is where then we'd be generating the data that we would then share with all of you in order to allow all of us to then evaluate the effectiveness of this. And so pr proposed location at Port Canaveral, right now the plan is for one year of operation. Run the test, break down the pumps, summarize our results, and then we all make a decision of whether this is something to go forward with or not. The system is relatively low volume, and it's a, a, an order of magnitude lower volume than prior plans that have been proposed, which helps with permitting, costs, and potential impacts. And it will allow, the way we've designed it, it will allow a direct test of inflow, uh, our inflow predictions. We're, we're submitting permits this fall with this, the, the new round of support from the state. And then if the permitting process goes forward well, then in, we're hoping that by spring 2024, we'll actually be up and operational with this system and we'll then see what happens in this cove and then extrapolate from there what's gonna happen to the broader IRL. And so we're really looking forward to this opportunity. We think that there's a potential here, a really good potential to help impact the lagoon, but we need to test these, the, our, our preliminary findings. And we do we need to recognize that there is lots of ongoing work in the lagoon that's making a difference right now. And our question is whether this can complement that effort and not replace it. This is not gonna be a silver bullet. This is, it would be, if anything, it's a complement to the ongoing effort. And I want to thank everybody who's helped with this work. We can't do it without you, and we're going to continue to need your support. And we thank all of you for your interest in this project. And, and, and afterwards, I, I really look forward to taking any questions that you all have about that. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Evil and all our presenters tonight. Uh, I, I think we've really got a good perspective on some of the things that we can talk about. While we're adjusting the stage here to bring the uh, panelists out, I'd like to uh, ask you a couple questions. First of all, uh, how many here is this your first Lagoon Straight Talk that you've been to? Just raise your hand. All right, that's great. I mean, that's really what we're looking to do is try to get the, uh, some people that haven't heard the message before, try to get it out to them. So thank you for coming out. The other thing I'd like to ask you is uh, kind of a location question. Uh, how many of you uh, do not live beachside? All right, that's great. Because 
the impact, uh, I live beachside, but a lot of the people on beachside don't, don't realize that some people don't see that lagoon every day. They don't drive across the bridges, so they don't really see what's going on out there. So I'm really appreciative that, that you're coming out. My last question is, how many, is there anyone here that does not reside in Brevard County? There's one in the back. All right, thank you for coming all the way to Brevard County to hear, hear our story. So we're gonna have, uh, in addition to the, the uh, speakers that you just listened to, we're gonna have a couple additional uh, folks join us on the, uh, <coughs> that will be able to answer some of your questions. Uh, as Jeff uh, spoke, we're going to have uh, Austin Fox will actually be joining us, another professor here that's worked on the lagoon, under, really understands the lagoon chemistry and how that oxygen makes, the, uh, ma makes it work, makes this inflow project work. And <coughs> from the county, uh, we're going to have Anthony Gubler. Uh, he, Anthony is on the Save Our Indian River Lagoon staff, and uh, Anthony has been... I can't remember how long Anthony's been there, but uh, he's been there for quite a while. He knows a lot of the ins and outs. Anthony has focused probably more on the septic sewer side, which a lot of people are interested in. You know, what, you know why? You know, what is there uh, in how are we fixing the sewage problems, the septic systems, and, and so forth? So uh, I'm going to uh, invite our panelists to come out and, and take a position on the stage here. So what we're going to do uh, is, like I said, w the, we need the questions from you. So if you could all hand your uh, uh, cue cards to the, uh, your question cards to the, the center, and we'll pick them up, or to the aisles, and we'll, we'll, we'll pick them up. And then we'll bring them up here. I've got a couple here that, were, that I got from previously that I'm going to start with. Okay. <laughs> we got one more. Okay, I'm gonna uh, start with the first question here. Uh, what, what did we lose? <laughs> uh, the question is, how much do leaky septics and leaking sewer laterals contribute to the, contribute to the IRL pollution? Um, Anthony, you wanna try that one? Can anyone hear me? There yeah. we go. All right. So, Based on modeling and sampling, we're seeing um, septic systems contributing about 20% of the nitrogen loading to Brevard County's portion of the Indian River Lagoon. Um, as far as um, leaky uh, sewer laterals, we don't have um, a hard percent. Um, we do know they um, are a big impact during storms and flooding events. So in Brevard County, a lot of our groundwater is really high. So if there are holes in the sewer laterals um, or if we have a flooding event and your um, sewer cap is broken off, that water goes into the sewer system. It um, can overflow um, at certain points. Um, it can overload the sewer plants and um, cause problems there. So it's, we just don't have a hard number for how big of an issue. Thank you, Anthony. Anyone else have a comment on that? Okay, I'll move to the next question. Uh, data, has the data suggested yet whether herbicides has an impact on seagrass growth? That's the first part of the question. Um, anybody want to take that? Dwayne, you want to try that? No. On yet? Ooh. Uh, the answer is we, we have a lot to learn about herbicide impacts, but here's what we do know. Um, for herbicides, and most of the herbicide spraying that occurs in the watershed is up in the tributaries, the, you know, the, the drainage ditches, you know, the efforts that municipalities uh, do to keep the drainage uh, moving. But there's also a lot of use of chemicals on residential properties. And so I use a kind of a common sense rule. And so if herbicides were driving the loss of seagrasses, we should see a similar loss in our 
macroalgae, and we don't. Macroalgae, this is probably the biggest year I've ever seen with Calerpa. Um, does that mean that it's not a problem? You know, I remember, um, this is not a quote, but a paraphrase, it's 60 years old uh, from Rachel Carson, and that uh, quote is basically, when it comes to chemicals, if it's not essential, we shouldn't be using it. And, and that's how I look at this. If we need to be reducing every pollutant that we don't absolutely need to be using for some functional process, you know, whether it's herbicides or pesticides or, you know, you see it. In fact, I saw it today. It was a car next to me uh, when I stopped to park for lunch. Uh, that was leaking oil in the parking lot. When they pulled out, there was a puddle of oil that had to be, you know, close to a cup of oil. In the first rain, that's going into a drainage ditch, that's going to the lagoon. So are chemicals a problem? Yes. Uh, some of them are a big problem. P PFOA, PFOS, we know that is a human health issue. EPA has just really dramatically reduced the drinking water standards uh, where no amount is a healthy amount in drinking water. Uh, but right now with herbicides, you know, we've got some work to do, but there's no evidence that the loss of seagrasses is being driven by herbicides. This is a kind of a two-part question. Right, can, I, can I add to that too real quick? Sorry. Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so again, this, as Dwayne said, you know, and on the Citizen Oversight Committee, we are, we are always looking for that latest science and that expert knowledge. So what we have been doing is working on mechanical harvesting. And that, that to us is huge. Because if you're not going to be spraying, what are you going to be doing in mechanical harvesting? So we have a program, a reimbursement program to municipalities to give them, not give them, but, but to help, help them achieve a harvester. And so a lot of people ask us, you know, questions about that. And for us, we, we want the people to use the harvesters. Um, the thing is, is again, on the Citizens Oversight Committee, we're trying to be efficient with the sales tax. And so for us to buy a harvester that the, a city doesn't have staff to use, that to us might not be the most efficient use of those monies. So we are, we are waiting, we are collecting more information and learning, um, but, but I want to ride a harvester, and if I do, I'll, I'll put it on Facebook. <laughs> if, if anybody has one, look, uh, reach me after the uh, presentation. Thank you, Vinny. Anyone else have a comment on that? Just, I'll, I'll drop a, a hint. to Anybody who wants to do herbicide work on seagrasses, um, we're planning on uh, funding an RFP sometime in the next two grant cycles uh, to at least start looking at toxic, toxicology ranges. It's complicated science, it's expensive science, uh, but you know, the absence of data is not a good thing, and so we try to fill those gaps when we can. So the NEP is going to try to fund a little research just to answer some questions that are out there. Okay, thank you. Do uh, so we're going to go back to sewers again. <laughs> That's a dirty word, right? Um, I read a lot about sewer spills. If we fix that, have we fixed the lagoon's problems? Some people think that. Anthony? So we dug into this um, at Natural Resources to try and um, see how big of an issue this was and put it into context with some of the other problems affecting the lagoon. And we found that, um, I believe it is uh, 12 years of data um, leading up to 2020 equaled about 16 days of the septic systems that are in the Indian River Lagoon watershed in Brevard County. So those are properly working septic systems in 16 days equals 12 years of sewage spills in Brevard County. So just to add to that, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what sewage spills entail. And a lot of those are overflow due to uh, seepage of groundwater, rainwater into the systems. And so it's actually diluted wastewater that's often discharged. And a global average is 40 milligrams per liter of nitrogen in wastewater. Um, so we're diluting from there, but if we use that 40 milligrams per liter, that doesn't mean much to you, but that's roughly two to 300 pounds of nitrogen per million gallons of sewage that is spilled. And so when we're looking at tens of thousands of pounds, right, all of a sudden, even a relatively large sewage spill locally has huge impacts, right? But on a lagoon-wide scale, and when we talk about the reductions that we're making, these sewage spills, we need to think about them in the context of 
the other progress that's been made, right? So we just be careful when we think about the impacts. And I'm gonna jump in and just say, you know, harmful algal blooms don't care where the nitrogen and phosphorus is coming from. So every pound matters. You know, we live in the Space Coast. It's the 21st century. Um, there is no excuse in my mind as we move forward from here to not have 21st century wastewater, uh, which is advanced wastewater treatment. No direct discharges of, of large volumes of reclaimed water that don't meet advanced wastewater treatment and, and full handling and management of biosolids. Um, we've got work to do there, but if you look at places, and Sarasota Bay is a really good example. Uh, Sarasota Bay and Tampa Bay were two examples that I used to use, you know, 10 years and, and beyond, saying here's two examples where they really got it right. And in Sarasota Bay, a number of their wastewater treatment plants, because of rapid population growth, moved away from the standards they had, you know, just because of, you know, capacity. And they started to see some declines. And in fact, every estuary in Florida is, for the most part, showing some seagrass loss. So having 21st century infrastructure is critical to not just our community quality of life, but our economy. And you can't grow if you've got, you know, inadequate wastewater. You can't grow if you've got flooding inadequate stormwater. So upgrading these infrastructure, and, and both of your comments are absolutely right. When you put it in a context of comparison, you know, what we say in the National Estuary Program, and Keith Winston at Brevard Zoo does a lot, it's not or, it's and. You know, we need to fix wastewater, and we need to fix stormwater and we need to fix septic wherever we can as fast as we can and some of it is not just about the lagoon it's just about having good infrastructure for a growing population so we keep the quality of our communities hold off of that so this problem is not being ignored it's being addressed at many levels so the lagoon program is helping um on the private side doing um, smoke testing to try and find where these um, deficiencies are occurring in sewer laterals that could cause flooding and uh, or um, over um, spills during flooding events. Um, our local utilities in this county are investing hundreds of millions of dollars to um, fix a backlog of issues that were allowed to just develop over the decades. And then our representatives at the state level have recognized how big of an issue it is statewide and locally here and have passed laws that are requiring our utilities here and across the state to um, bring their standards to advanced treatment. If so, if they, if local utilities have any impact to surface waters or other, um, even re using reclaim, they have to meet new higher standards in the coming years. Thank you. So, kind of staying on the, the subject of nutrients in the water, uh, we have a couple of questions on helping, help me define what nutrients mean and also what other pollutants have been found in the IRL besides nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, Austin, well, you want to take that? What was the first part of the question? <laughs> How do you define nutrients in the, in the lagoon that, create, that are causing pollution? So nutrients is an interesting word, right? So we think about nitrogen and phosphorus, and that's because these are typically the limiting nutrients. There are certainly other characters, and so if you've bought, I hope you haven't, but if you've gone to the fertilizer aisle, right, you'll see that fertilizers have other things in them. Um, and so different fertilizer for fertilizers for different kinds of plants. And the relative abundance of the different elements can actually help promote certain types of plants over others. Um, but I think my key point here is we've spent a lot of time talking about totals, right? The total nitrogen. And from a nutrient or trace element perspective, I think a lot about the type of nitrogen. And so most of you have probably heard of nitrate. Most of you have probably heard of ammonia. Um, 
And so when we talk about the totals, I think about the species. And so whether we have nitrate or whether we have ammonia or whether we have organic nitrogen. And we can learn a lot by looking at that speciation. And so we've seen in the data that I've looked at this decrease in the relative abundance of things like nitrate. And so seagrasses can help bring up that nitrate. But a lot of the processes that we talk about, the natural removal of nutrients from the system, depend on getting that nitrate number up, right? We have to get those nitrifying bacteria to come back in populations. And so where I'm headed with this is I start to think a lot about bacteria. If the bacteria aren't healthy, the lagoon's not going to be healthy. And so I'm trying to bring attention back to the sediments. Um, and so when we talk about nutrients, I think talking about total nitrogen, total phosphorus is too big of buckets. I like to think about the speciation and promoting uh, the nitrogen cycling. So maybe that's, I don't know if that it's, answers that's the question. Good, thank you. I, I think that there's this, the second part of this is a question of are there other pollutants other than nitrogen and phosphorus that are causing the problem in our lagoon? So that's a great question, and I think we've already addressed some of those, things like glyphosate. Um, but one of the things that I will mention is hydrogen sulfide. And so if you've been to the lagoon, you've probably noticed that rotten egg smell. And this is a pollutant, right? It, it, has, it wreaks havoc on this nutrient cycling. Um, it wreaks havoc. It's toxic to humans. It's toxic to seagrasses. But it's there because of the organic matter. This is not something that we've put in. It's there because we've created an environment where the bacteria are producing this respiration or waste product. Um, and so there are many pollutants, but in my opinion, I think hydrogen sulfide has the potential to be one of the most influential things, and it's in some ways naturally occurring. And just because I want to talk after Dr. Fox, so I sound intelligent as well. Um, I, I, I think the key, the key part of that nutrient is excess. Excess nutrient and excess phosphorus. They're in the system. The problem is, is there's too much. And so that's what feeds those harmful algal blooms or feeds the actual species, right? Am I right? There's the actual uh, alien species that came to us in 2016. Um, but that's what feeds it. The excess nitrogen and phosphorus, excess phosphorus. So that's what, that's what we're focused, uh, have been focused on, on removing. Very good. Anybody else have a comment on that? I mean, th this is a big, wide open question when you talk about other nutrients. So, uh, and I know a lot of people have a different perspective of what, what causes the algal blooms and what causes the problems in the lagoon. <coughs> so, you know, keep asking deta more detailed questions and we'll try to get them answered. Uh, <coughs> This is, a, uh, I think, a question for Vinny, but uh, is the money uh, collected, and I assume this is from the half-cent sales tax, used only for the IRL, or can the county commission use it for other items in the county? <laughs> They're going to fight over it. <laughs> well, so the question is, is can the county use the money for other what in the county? For, for other, uh, uh, other projects, basically. So can, this can is the county commission decide to be the money, the half cent sales tax money is to be used. For so the, the sales tax money and, and the ballot initiative and ordinance that was passed and the project plan bases the reimbursements on pounds of nitrogen or pounds of phosphorus. So if there is a project that is removing a pound of nitrogen or pound of phosphorus, I guess in in theory, uh, I'm not a legal expert, although I, I, I'll, I'll play the I'll play the lawyer on the on the table. Um, but um, I, I guess in theory, the ordinance says the county commission, um, you know, could edit the project as we or project plan as we recommend it. So could they? Probably. Um, but again, the reimbursement dollars are based on nitrogen and phosphorus because we're trying to remove the excess from going in the lagoon or that's already in the lagoon? Anthony? Yeah, per the ordinance that was voted on in 2016. I'm gonna just weigh in to say how unique this is. You know, I work with 28 national estuary programs around the nation, and when I tell them about the Sorrel program, the amount of money that's being raised, and the fact that it's exclusive to this nutrient reduction 
you know, plan that was placed, you know, in front of us as voters back in 2016, you know, there, people are shocked. They're going, you mean a single county is committing those kinds of dollars? It's really a, a, a historical moment for the lagoon and a historical win because of you and your vote and our vote. I live in Brevard too, uh, because this is not the norm when you look at committed dollars from local municipalities. Uh, along the lagoon, we've got uh, ad valorem taxes being used. Uh, we have sales taxes, so some discretionary sales tax in Indian River County. Um, they tried to pass one in Volusia County, um, and they weren't able to. St. Lucie County, it took them two rounds, and it was mainly infrastructure. So having this kind of program at this kind of scale dedicated to water quality improvement is not the norm. It really does place us in a, a really, you know, higher level on a national scale. And they are talking about us. In fact, uh, I will be meeting with federal, uh, very high level federal administrative folks tomorrow from EPA um, and also from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And, they, you know, they go, gosh, over $500 million, 10 years from a county? You know, it's more than we see from the federal government. It's more than we see, you know, from the state. So we have taken this challenge on our own as a local community in a way that all of you and everybody should be proud of. Thank you, Dwayne. Just, just, just to add that, because uh, I'm, I'm just thinking long term now, and I know the question was about the county commission, but first off, uh, Dwayne, if you need somebody at that meeting to represent an attorney, I, I'll be at that meeting if you, if you want me. Um, no, um, so here's the thing. Again, the Citizens Oversight Committee, we're taking a look at all the science. And yes, the project plan is based on pound per nitrogen or pound per phosphorus. But if we find out their science says, you know, maybe we ought to look at this or maybe we ought to try to find a way to achieve a project, then we're going we're gonna to work on that. We're going to try to find a way to do it. But the most important thing to us, again, is that trust that you all put on us to spend the dollars wisely. It's huge. I, 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 don't, I don't take that trust lightly at all, and, and I know for a fact many, if not all, the members do. So we're going to look, and we're going to follow the science. We're going to keep learning and see what better is. And if we find something, then we'll try to find a way. But we'll talk about it in a meeting, and if you agree, come to the meeting. If you disagree, come to the meeting too. Um, again, it's all about is what Dwayne said. We took that power, and we took that choice upon ourselves as a county. And so we want to do this the best way that we can. Vinny, while you still have the microphone, uh, where can the average citizen find the actual contracts for projects completed? Uh, good question. Um, so there are a list of the projects that are on our website. For the projects completed, I believe, Anthony, the county's um, system, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, contracts management system, you can go into the county's contract management system and look up the contracts. But, but, but you know, and it, it, it's kind of a funny thing from the Citizens Oversight Committee. We get, we get people saying, oh, it's taking too long. You're, you're, not, you're not spending the money quick enough. And then we got people going, well, you're just giving money out to everybody. And so it, it can't be both ways. It can't. And so what we're doing is we're using the county's system that they have for, for years, uh, you know, to handle the reimbursements. And there's a lot of hoops. It's red tape. It's government red tape. It's out there. But again, it's made sure to make sure the dollars are spent right. Your tax dollars, not just your sales tax, but your property tax is spent the same way. And so there is a website, I think it's the contracts management, where you can go on and look at the different contracts. I hope that answers the question, because that's an important thing. They, it's it's kind of difficult to get this information uh, so having the people here that can tell you where to find it, it is real important. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to switch. And, always, and again, you can always email or call me. If you have a specific question, let me know, and I will dig and I will find it. David Lane will, too. He's there in the third row. He's also on the Citizens Oversight Committee. Raise your hand, David. <laughs> there you go. So email or call him or bug him on the way out as well. So we're going to uh, switch lanes a little bit here. Uh, this is a question probably to the whole panel, but... The question is, is it possible to have an open connection to the ocean and Patrick Air, at, at Patrick Air Force Base? An open connection. Anybody want to take that? 
Uh, the Patrick Air Force Base is one of many sites that's been explored for a potential future inflow system. Um, there, there's, no matter where a system, if a system was to be constructed, there are logistical constraints in, in any location. Um, but there are a few places that uh, are more amenable to a system. I mean, it, it, a lot of the costs have to do with the, the actual distance to, to offshore environments and then the routes that you'd have to take to be able to move that water. And Patrick Air Force Base, is, it, because of its, its narrow width, presents some, uh, so, some benefits that way. But uh, the, the St. John's study that was, uh, um, uh, was done in 2017, they, they looked at 32 different sites across the lagoon, and they prioritized the sites as potential future inflow sites. And, and Patrick Air Force Base and um, Port Canaveral were in the, the top five, I, I think, along with a few other sites um, in the Banana River, one other site at least in the Banana River, and, uh, and then a couple other sites. And, and as we move forward, as we pr present, summarize our data and, and share it, if it looks like inflow is really something that's, that's, that's worth continuing to pursue, then we'll have a really, uh, the, the, we'll, we'll start having a really critical look at different sites and we'll discuss the, the options, the benefits, and the feasibility of these individual sites um, before we evaluate you know, what one might work. Yeah. Probably the question I get the most is, you know, why don't we crack a new inlet through the Barrier Island? You know, it's a question that actually uh, citizens have been asking all the way back to the 1800s. Uh, but for different reasons. Back then it was transportation and getting out to the ocean for commercial fishing. The challenge with an inlet, number one, is that, you know, the inlet itself doesn't solve a problem. You know, water has a tendency to ebb and flow. We don't have large tidal cycles. And so even in Sebastian Inlet, Fort Pierce Inlet, right now uh, we've had seagrasses losses even around our inlets. And we've had algal blooms, although they're not as severe. You know, it's a combination of that ocean exchange, but you have to look at the land as well. In Brevard County, we have a long residence time. So what are the risks of a new inlet? And the risks are actually the Bear Island protects the mainland from hurricanes and storm surge. So if you put a new inlet, let's say, at Patrick Air Force Base, uh, number one, you're going to have to manage sand because you're going to have erosion just like we do at all of our inlets. You're going to need a taxing district because it's going to take millions of dollars to keep that inlet open. So you're going to have to manage sand. You're going to have to build a bridge. You know, that's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars probably. On, and plus we've got sea level rise, so it's a high risk area. But the other side of this is that you're going to expose a whole section of the mainland. So right there it could be, you know, Merritt Island, it could be cocoa, depending on where you place it, to storm surge, uh, where they're not susceptible to storm surge. So a lot of risks, you have to weigh cost benefits in all of this. And I go back, <coughs> excuse me, to what I said earlier. Um, the root cause of the Indian River Lagoon problem is nutrients. And the solution to that is to put the lagoon on a serious nutrient diet uh, from every source that we have. It's worked at Narragansett Bay, it's worked in Chesapeake Bay, it worked in Tampa Bay, it worked in Sarasota Bay. We know that works. It's not the whole solution, uh, but if you don't get the water quality right, you don't get seagrasses. You don't have seagrasses, you don't have manatees. So the whole manatee, seagrass, ecosystem health story starts with water quality, and that means reducing the nutrient and pollutant loads and you just don't solve that problem. And as Jeff said, you know, there are tools that can help. There may be tools that can kind of ease some of those stressors and improve some of that nutrient cycling, uh, but none of those tools without nutrient reduction are gonna work. You know, and that's where we need to keep our focus and exactly where Sorrel has its focus. And, and we have to keep our, our eye on the ball on that, otherwise we'll lose this war. And, and, and you know, I think Dr. Ebel had said, or maybe Dwayne did as well, that, um, that the system is unique. And if anybody has had a chance, drive down the Indian River Lagoon and see the area between some of the other inlets. The water is different. It's different. And again, not that that uh, ocean water isn't a tool in our tool belt, but each system is unique and is different.
And so I would love to see, as Dwayne said, us to put the system on a diet. And then if we need to, or we, or we find that that works, maybe introduce some, some, you know, some ocean water. But, but I, I, I know for myself, I'm just very cautious. I've lived in this area um, for a long time. And I don't want to change something if it's not needed. I'd like to bring it back to the healthy system that it was. Thank you. So <laughs> I'm going to move to, um, this is, I think, another septic one. But uh, <clears throat> what is being done to address removal of septic tanks on the barrier islands and ones that are adjacent to canals that feed into the lagoon? All right. So fortunately, majority of the septic systems on the barrier island um, were removed long ago, um, back in the 60s and 80s. Um, we do have some remaining in the South Beaches and throughout uh, Merritt Island and, and also along the canals throughout the mainland of Brevard County. So um, as was shown in the presentations earlier, about 43% of the soil um, funds are going to addressing the septic issue and that is with septic to sewer projects. Um, this is um, going into the most vulnerable um, areas of the county. These are um, areas where septic systems have been um, modeled and monitored um, through groundwater testing to have the highest impact to the lagoon of all the septics around, because we have 53,000 septic systems in the IRL watershed in Brevard County, um, so we can't address them all. We don't have the billions of dollars. So how do we focus these funds? We use some modeling, we use some groundwater testing, and now we're bringing in um, the main lines um, into these existing neighborhoods and uh, providing opportunities um, for these homeowners to connect and remove their septic systems. And this will be you know, a long-term benefit. Um, these projects um, can't happen overnight. Um, bringing in infrastructure projects like this into in existing communities requires um, a few years of planning around existing utilities such as um, water service, FPNL, gas lines, um, and providing the, uh, or finding the land needed to site um, the lift stations and sewer lines as needed. And, and we'll see if this works. Craig, can I, can I call for a slide? You said no extra sure. slides, right? Can I get slide number three? Let's see if this works. Can we do a Vinny slide number three? <laughs> what we're trying to do is give him the uh, ability to show some vi visuals here while we're answering questions. Wow, what a team. All right, anyways, Thanks. if you look on our website, there's a maps button. If you click the maps button, you'll see what, the first thing is our uh, Lagoon Project story map, which is really cool. I wish I could show it live. But um, you can actually click and see all the different septic projects live, all the different um, sewer projects, all the uh, muck projects, everything live, move it around like Google Maps and click on the area and see uh, how much uh, nitrogen and phosphorus it's, um, it's, it's designed to remove. There is also, right, I think down the bottom it says septic overlay map. It's Dr. Ebel, can you get off the stage, please? No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> but right, right where he is, yeah. So, so there you go, septic overlay map. So if you go there again, you can see the areas. Um, that, that we're looking to uh, remove the septic tanks. Uh, another, another thing on this too, and, and for those that have seen the meetings know, we have advertised to people to say, please remove your septic, we're gonna reimburse you. And not everybody wants to do it. Um, you know, it, it, it requires your yard being torn up and, and, and other things. So we actually expanded the area uh, to try to get more septic systems removed. So if you know anybody who's gotten a card and they say, I got a postcard from the county and I don't know about it, tell them to do it. Tell them to do it. But, but this, is, this is that whole thing about education, about snowballing. We started, we voted in 2016 to do this. And it'll happen. It's just going to take time. But those are some story maps up there. You should check them out. Yeah, and um, there are some new story maps um, coming out. Um, so look for those. I know they should be live um, anytime. I guess they're supposed to be live this week. Um, and so the one that is existing up there is basically just trying to um, give you a visual um, digestion of the plan. You know, here's where the projects are. So this new one's coming out is going to give more um, background on the why and how. So look forward to that. Again, you know, we're, we're trying to improve. 
but we need all your brains together to help us improve. So if you have ideas, give them to us. We'll give you your brain back, I promise. So this is a, uh, <clears throat> an inflow question. Uh, can ocean inflow project possibly bring in plankton and other things that could cause m more of a problem for the lagoon? Uh, that's, that's definitely a concern, um, and it's something that we are actually addressing in our research plan. With, with the pilot project itself, we've, we've purposely sited near the port where there was already inflow coming through the, the locks, so we mitigate that concern somewhat. Um, but we also are, as part of our operational plan for the demonstration project, we will be uh, aligning with the, um, the management plan from the port and the locks in order to ensure that um, pollutants from the port themselves don't make it into the, the, um, the, the, the lagoon through the inflow system. But then also we have monitoring that we'll be doing to be able to, if needed, stop the system. If there is an introduction of red tide, if there's some even a, a hint of red tide being introduced and a bloom initiating, the system has been designed to be able to be turned off and to then help mitigate that risk. And so that's, it's part of our research plan is to better understand that risk. We will, with inflow, there is some change in salinity that does actually create opportunities for other species to exist within the lagoon, that including red tide, that could be a potential risk, but then it, we, we've seen through the inlets, we've seen through the port opening that that risk has so far been relatively low. We don't expect that to change, but we need to monitor that. We can't assume that that's the case. And so a, a monitoring plan for the demonstration project has already been established. And in some future inflow system, there would be also a, a monitoring that would be required as part of that system, I imagine. Thank you. That's a complex question. I know it's not an easy answer. Um, but we'll be watching your pilot project to, to, to see how that works out. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of a, I'm going to give this to Austin. Uh, are there any plans to address the negative effects of causeways and how they affect water flow in the lagoon? Yeah, hydrology question. Is that a better question for Dwayne? I'll, I'll follow up. So when you look at um, transportation corridors across the lagoon, you know, there's well over, if you count each causeway bridge combination, you know, so for example, 520, you know, is a single corridor, but there's two, you know, bridge and dredge fill components, one over Indian River, you know, one over the Banana River. If you look at them all, there's over 40. Uh, we did a preliminary study with Tetra Tech, because I wanted to know, you know, how much compartmentalization have we actually created with those dredge and fill causeways? And you have to be careful because this isn't block water because the water, you know, the water flow patterns change. And what happens is that instead of flowing across the whole lagoon, you know, now you're hydraulicking through those deeper water channels and the intercoastal waterway the, where the bridge is. But it's about 75%. So it's pretty significant, especially in Brevard. Uh, Gary Zarillo here at uh, Florida Tech did a study for us um, in a conversation we were having for a number of years with Florida DOT uh, because they were looking and will be expanding 528 uh, to six lanes. And, and we had two concerns early on in those discussions, which we voiced to DOT. Uh, one was making sure that they were using the proper uh, models for sea level rise, uh, so those, whatever they reconstructed, had good resilience to rising sea level and storm surge. And the second was to at least look at the opportunities uh, to mitigate some of those causeway uh, closures with either opening up bridge spans uh, or possibly putting, you know, culverts. Uh, which you can hydraulically dredge these days underneath the roadway. And you see those, you know, in the Atlantic, you see some of those small uh, openings that can get water to the corners. And what was interesting by Gary's work, you know, he said it was a wind-driven system. And he looked at multiple models, uh, which we shared with DOT. Um, if we just open up, I think it was about 1,000 feet at the bridge span on 528, and then when they come down to 520, which is in the queue for upgrades, 
uh, did a low level elevation bridge, uh, you could improve internal flow between nine and 17%. Now, what does that mean? Well, we know it improves flow. We know that organisms that you know, move around like seagrass seeds that have to disperse with water flow, you can get some of that dispersal into the corners. Uh, flow matters, and you know, some of the work that Austin has done you know, with low dissolved oxygen, uh, you have all seen in the summertime, you know, when we start having winds and this calerpa and the grass kind of blows up in the corners and it starts smelling on decomposition, you know, some of that you know, would be moving down through the system, but it gets trapped in those corners. They're shallow, they get hot, they get stagnant, and so you get really low water quality. Uh, but it's a heavy lift. So if you want to improve causeways, you know, you need to make early commitments. And so I'm guardedly optimistic that we got DOT's attention. Uh, we know this has worked really well down in the Florida Keys at Lake Surprise. Uh, we know it has worked really well in other locations around the nation where causeways have obstructed flow. And so this is a mindset change as we look at uh, the dredge fill, the landfill portion of causeways, uh, where at least we need to ask the question, do we have an opportunity to improve both the, you know, the coastal resilience of this infrastructure to make it safer during storms, make it more resilient to overwash, um, and can we improve flow? So the answer is we should be looking at that at every causeway improvement we have and uh, you won't see any additional dredge fill uh, issues, but when you start looking at the causeways, especially 520, uh, 528, some of the causeways that feed into Kennedy Space Center, um, think about a system that naturally, as a lagoon-type estuary, it has low flow and long residence time because that's how estuaries that are lagoons work. And then you start basically putting these obstructions in and all you do is compartmentalize even more. And so you have to start thinking about how you manage, how you reduce septic loads and stormwater runoff. Now thinking about what are those obstructions? What keeps, you know, we like to say, you know, what goes in the lagoon stays in the lagoon. So Southern Mosquito Lagoon, Northern Indian River Lagoon, Banana River, especially north of 528, and that water is not moving anywhere fast, you know, and, and because of that, it's highly vulnerable. So, yeah, we need to be looking at our transportation corridors, and when we have an opportunity to fix something, um, we need to look at the costs, and, and I don't know about you all, but nothing I like better than going down to the Keys and running over a low-span bridge. They're beautiful, the tourists love them, you get good water flow, and any of you who fish, I know Rodney has fished more than a few, you know, causeways down in the Florida Keys for tarpon. That structure winds up actually becoming really good fishing territory. And so flow matters, and we need to pay attention to it. Thanks, Dwayne. So I guess the comment that I'll add is, one of the really cool things about the research that we do is I work on research to, to study certain projects like the inflow project, but what we learn from that is not applicable only to the inflow project, right? We can learn about processes that are happening in the corners of where these causeways are, right? And so we've found some of the worst sediment quality, right, in the corners of where these causeways are. And so we're learning so much about how circulation impacts the sediment and the bacteria that are in those sediments and their ability to remove nutrients. And so I, we talk a lot about managing the inputs, but I think we also need to think about managing where it goes, right? So everything that comes in has to go out, and if we can promote those healthy sediments, the good bacteria that live in those sediments, they can help to remove some of the nitrogen that's coming in. And so the inputs and the removal mechanisms are important to consider. And so we've certainly seen near causeways, again, some of the worst sediment quality. Um, and 
So what we're learning from these studies has actually contributed to helping us think about restoration, right? So I've accidentally got involved in some restoration projects because we're looking at the sediment quality as a function of circulation, as a function of causeways, as a function of ocean inflow. And we've been able to say, okay, if we restore an area here, it may be less successful than if we restore an area over here. And so we're starting to be able to apply what we're learning from one study to help many different aspects of lagoon restoration. And so I think we have to leverage what we can to learn about this system. The gained knowledge has many applications. And so I think causeways, they've certainly been a bad thing, but we can look at it almost as there's been some benefits. And we haven't, I don't think muck has come up yet this evening. Um, but part of that infrastructure where we built these causeways has led to the accumulation of muck in these deposits. And so dredging is something that's in the plan. And one of the things that we've dramatically changed, this is going back to the pollution, what is pollution? We've changed the circulation so much. We've changed the type of sediments that are coming into this system. And these causeways have inadvertently created a depositional environment where we are collecting these bad sediments, right? And so it's actually created this opportunity to relatively easily go and remove some of the most harmful and polluted areas. Um, if they weren't there, this would be more distributed. Um, so there's a little silver lining in there. Um, and on that note, right, dredging, so uh, dredging or removing the muck, we've turned off the supply of sediments to the lagoon. Right, of course, sediments. And so I won't go into it. I can speak for hours on the importance of sediments, but we've turned off the supply of sand, right? We're not bringing in coarse sand. Every five years, we dredge 100,000 cubic yards of sand from Sebastian Inlet and put it back on beaches. That is, sand is really important for sorbing and burying phosphorus. So we've talked about the nitrogen, but we need to keep in mind that removal of phosphorus. And so, all of the things we've worked on help to remove it into the sediments, but we need to figure out where those sediments are going. Historically, before humans stabilized inlets, that would have been buried in wetlands uh, under those flood shoals, right? If you live on a wide part of the lagoon, that's sand that came in during some historic opening of an inlet. And so this is, I'm probably getting a little too deep in, into the phosphorus and sediments, but we've learned a lot from these studies and causeways certainly play an important part of the changes that we've seen in the lagoon. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, you can talk to Dr. Fox about sediments and muck and stuff. He just, he knows everything about it. So I encourage you to call him if you have a question. Uh, <clears throat> here's a, a good question. I'm gonna, uh, we're kind of getting short on time here, but uh, are there plans to connect all of the developments in South Beach to the sewer system? And if not, why not? There are no current plans um, to connect all those developments. Um, part of the cost benefit analysis of running sewer lines is um, looks at the density of communities. And the thing with um, the South Beaches is actually um, not very dense compared to some other parts of, the, of Brevard County, um, specifically like in Merritt Island and stuff. So to bring sewer down there is going to cost, you know, tens, maybe a hundred million dollars um, to make a significant impact in that region of the county. And so when we, when we tried and, and you know, the Citizen Oversight Committee as well tries to prioritize um, sites. We're trying to get our most bang for the buck. Um, in the past, um, there have been barriers as such as um, what's called COBRA, the Coastal um, Barrier Island Resources Act, um, where um, there's federal restrictions on bringing development into these um, barrier islands. Um, we have, those rules have been clarified and so we know um, that it's possible to bring um, sewer to those communities. Um, we're just gonna need um, a lot more funding coming from the state um, if we're gonna be able to um, prioritize that area. And, and you know, one of the things too, and not, uh, not, not saying, that there are some really amazing septic tanks. 
Um, the Citizen Oversight Committee, we took a trip. It's almost like the Disney World of septic tanks. It was really cool. But, 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 but really, again, just as science has progressed, septic tanks have progressed. And there are some septic tanks that will treat the water just as good, if not better, than your, your, your uh, average um, waste treatment plant. So there, there are lots of options out there. And again, it's all about trying to find the one that's most efficient for our dollars. And if anyone is interested in um, learning more or um, looking at our grant program for upgrading a septic system, because you know you're just far from existing sewer, um, our email is irlproject at brevardfl.gov. And um, we have a booth um, out in the lobby, and um, Brandon can give you one of our cards, and we can have that um, conversation, um, see what's available. Um, there's um, about eight different um, advanced septic systems available in the state of Florida, and some of those can treat up to, um, you know, reduce your um, nitrogen inputs into the groundwater by 90%. So it's possible. And I just need to give a shout out to our Sunnyland orange shirt wearing group. I don't know if anybody here is from here from Sunnyland, but uh, no, again, just a group of people that live in Sunnyland, a community that got together and said, what can we do? And so they started coming to the meetings and we started working with them. And so uh, we're very, th again, that's what this program's about. This program's about us taking the power and us taking the decision and doing what we need to do to get the lagoon better. So thank you, Sunnyland. Yeah. So this is a, a good question. <clears throat> Once the target levels for nitrogen and phosphorus have been achieved, target levels, what can we expect, when can we expect seagrass to return and be sustainable? Simple question. It really is a good question. So here's what I can tell you that I don't know and what I can tell you that I know for absolutely sure. So trying to predict biological response, once you've hit what scientists call the tipping point, which was 2011, and then what happened, because it sustained itself for nine years and maybe beyond, a regime shift. So we have an ecosystem that scientifically is in a regime shift, which, which means that it's dramatically different than what it was prior to 2011 and the trajectory back to what we remember pre-2011 is almost impossible to predict. And there's a lot of really good scientific research, and including looking at seagrass recovery in the Chesapeake and the Baltic, um, that suggests that this pathway back to what you want um, isn't gonna be a straight line, it isn't gonna be easy to predict, um, and so here's what I can tell you. I can't tell you when we'll see recovery. I can't tell you how much we're gonna need to spend ultimately in order to get the recovery we really wanna see. And so we're gonna move through this first 10 years of Sorrel. We're gonna move through the years of NEP funding, state funding, additional federal funding. And every year we're gonna be watching where we are and you know, every five to 10 years, um, we're gonna be looking back. And so for our management plan, uh, five years, which will be 2025, we're gonna have a relook and an update of that plan. Um, and some of the science is gonna change some of our positions. Here's what I know, and I can tell you with 100% guarantee as a scientist, if we don't make this investment, this system gets worse. It is not going to recover on its own without our help. And, and especially with 750 to 1,000 people moving into the state of Florida. The other part of this story is we have talked all night about the remediation of existing conditions and conditions, you know, aging infrastructure, inadequate infrastructure, you know, poorly designed infrastructure, things that, you know, back in the day when we did it, you know, nobody thought about, you know, impacts that causeways might have on water flow back in the, 50s and 60s, they were just trying to get a road over to Kennedy Space Center back then, you know, it was Cape Canaveral, or a road over to the, the, the beaches for, you know, communities to come and go. Um, we're not gonna know ever exactly where we are. This is never a one and done. 
So think about e uh, economic development, EDCs. You know, they invest in the good times, and when you have downturns in economy, they actually increase their investment, trying to balance, right? Tourism, when tourism is riding a high note, they're still marketing like crazy. Uh, when tourism starts to go down a little bit, they even market more, find out, that's where we are. So we had a, have had a tendency over the last 50 years to think, well, we just invest some money, we're gonna fix these problems, and then we don't have to invest anymore. Um, ecosystem restoration and stewardship in clean water is a, gonna be a continual investment. And had we been doing this the last 50 years, treating water as valuable as it is to our quality of life, we wouldn't be where we are today. So I think the key is, you know, we will check the science, the progress, um, one hurricane could set us back five years. Um, one hurricane might surprise us and do some things that we didn't imagine, like up in uh, Hurricane Sandy when it hit New York, and I was up there for that, by the way. Um, and the fact is, we need to be adaptive, but we need to be responsible stewards from here on out. And the other part of the message we haven't talked about, and it means that we can't build the way we've been building for the last 50 years. We have to build better. You know, things like low impact development, you know, looking at sustainability, you know, looking at new materials. I mean, there's just the, the explosion of really cool, innovative ideas um, in development, design, and construction is just amazing. And even the you know, the Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has adopted an engineering with nature philosophy, um, which, you know, you think about that 20 years ago, I, I would never have imagined it, but we're recognizing that if you build with nature, you engineer with nature, not only do you get a better product, not only is it more resilient, uh, but it is actually, you know, a, a, a double benefit good infrastructure, it looks good, performs well, in, in many cases over the life cycle of the, whatever that infrastructure is, it's cheaper. And so we're, we're gonna need to think differently about how we develop, the way we look at stormwater, you know, making sure low impact development, sustainable building design, all of those things need to be part of this equation. Because if we fix all these problems, and we're estimating about $5 billion worth of effort. So that's $250 million over the next 20 years to get us there. And this is a kind of a low estimate. It's not completely, you know, impossible. The fact is the money is there. But if we keep doing what we did back in the 60s and 70s, all we do is, you know, we take two septic systems out of, out of the play. We add two in. So we're not gaining any ground if we, you know, continue to build the way we built before. So it's a combination of, you know, fixing the problems we have today and then building to the future so we don't create those problems, you know, and, and relive the last 40 years. So we have come to about the end of our time, unfortunately. I have a bunch of questions here from you all, and they will get answered. We're going to make sure that these get distributed to the <coughs> panelists, and we'll get answers to you, and they'll be available online on our website, and we'll try to send the information out. There's one last question I wanted to ask the panel. Uh, <clears throat> what is the most important thing that we can do as citizens to help the lagoon? <laughs> <laughs> the handoff. Keep the faith, keep working, you know, when you get a chance, you know, go get dirty, you know, plant some clams, plant some oysters, um, take a look at your yard, you know, if you're still fertilizing and using, you know, lots of pesticides and herbicides, you know, ask that same question, is this necessary, can I do this better? Um, we minimize very often the impacts of individual homes but you think about 1.6 million residents in the watershed, gosh, if we all cut back on chemical use and cut back on fertilizer, and I don't mean just in the rainy season, I think we get pretty good compliance. 
But if you're one of those homeowners uh, whose uh, gardeners decide that, well, we're finally out of that rainy season, you know, and we're into the dry winter, let's go ahead and fertilize, and then let's go ahead and let the sprinklers run for the next 12 hours to make sure we water it in. You've just made another rainy season, you know, for the day. So think about what you can do at your home, you know, what your footprint is, but get involved. Like Vinny said, they are available to you. If, if you call my number, you're gonna get me, you don't get a secretary. We are here to serve you. You know, these are, you know, we are, especially me, government employees. We're here to make sure that we do this right and to serve you. So, you know, we're here to help in any way we can, including going and chasing additional dollars. Those of you who are looking for grants, or you need some help, we give free grant writing. You know, if you're doing an Indian River Lagoon project, you need a grant writer, single page application if it meets the CCMP, we're gonna hand you a professional grant writer at no cost to you. So let's work together, let's communicate, coordinate, uh, but of all things, keep the face. Keep, we can do this, and we're well on our way to getting there. Uh, we may, in fact, we will need a second Sorrel. So a Sorrel 2.0, we won't be done with this in 10 years. So you need to have faith and trust that we're moving in the right direction uh, in order to make this work, and it'll happen. To add to that, I think you can make a difference. I, I think um, so many of us just feel like we're one person, we can't make that difference. But I've pressured my friends, right? I've pressured my neighbors. I said, you can contribute to making that difference because so many of the people that I know that care, right, they just kind of give up or ignore something that they could be doing because they're like, I'm just one person, right? So all of us as individuals need to tell our friends that we can make a difference. We need to keep that message going. Um, I had something else, but it's definitely very important. Thank you. So, and, and I guess the next thing is, on that note, right, I talk to so many people, I'm in the lagoon all the time, and they say, yeah, I really care, and then their landscaper comes out after they've gone inside and blows things in. And so, so keep tabs on these things, right? Watch your landscapers, find landscapers, find services that actually do make a difference, right? So, so you can have an impact. If you're looking for ideas, there's a lobby full of all the just the people around the community that are working on this. You know, there's, it's not just, you know, your representatives up here and your public servants up here. It's um, Brevard Zoo, MRC, um, Surfrider. Just go talk to them. They'll give you ideas. Um, we also have um, lots of information on websites out there. So if you have a good memory and you want to remember this, lagoonloyal.com has very um, simple things to um, learn about and actions to take. Rivar, um, the Indian, Indian River uh, Council, um, and um, you guys have a flyer, right, for all the little things that a homeowner and um, resident can do to improve. Um, there's the zoo and MRC have volunteer opportunities. Um, Orca and Fight for Zero are looking for assistance on their projects. So, you know, definitely reach out and get engaged and get dirty. Thank you, Anthony. And just to emphasize that point, uh, there's also Lagoon Loyal, which is a, a site that the county supports, which has a lot of information about what you can do. But getting out there and volunteering, you know, some of the groups that are that have tabled out here today, those are the people that you go to uh, to really get involved. The, the zoo, obviously, uh, and Marine Resource Council. So that's where you can actually get some hands-on interaction. So learn and they have a lot of information on their websites as well as the coalition does. So the coalition's website is helpthelagoon.org. Uh, go there and you will get, you know, we've got some uh, samples of what you can do in your yard, you know, uh, different plantings and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so there's a lot of information available. We'll try to make it all available to you. One last uh, question is actually for me, um, is will tonight's program be available online? And yes, it will be. Uh, we did uh, record it on YouTube, uh, at least we think we did. Uh, <coughs> but we will, we will advertise that on our, face, uh, our 
uh, front page of our website, so you can go there and check it out to find out how to, uh, how to get that. So it was recorded and it will be available. So with that, I'm going to say, ask uh, that uh, you, you give this uh, panel a big round of applause and thank you. <clears throat> and my last closing note here is if you have a chance, do another survey for us. It's only three questions, but it gives us an idea of, you know, did we pass, did we fail, and, and what can we do better? So thank you very much tonight for coming out tonight. We, a great crowd, and we appreciate it. See you next Straight Talk. Bye now. Oh, we've got a lot of questions. Yeah, I know. <laughs>